good morning and welcome to Southern Hills this morning. We do want to extend a special welcome to all of our guests and visitors, as well as those of you joining us via live stream. Um, if you are visiting with us this morning and have not had a chance to stop by our Welcome Center, there's plenty of information back there about Southern Hills. Also, I hope everyone's had a chance to pick up one of our bulletins. There's a lot of information concerning uh, different activities and our sick and shut-in list in the bulletin, but just a few announcements we'd like to make before we begin, we do want to continue to remember Sharon Welburn and Barbara Jones as they are both going through uh, chemo treatments. Also, Bobby Wilhoyt is at NHC Place in Cool Springs. Uh, Joanne Clark is having some radiation treatments for some skin cancer on her face. Also, Jean Sweeney will be having some tests run um, in the next few weeks. Um, Shannon Woodruff's latest update is that she is holding her own, so that is good news um, on Shannon Woodruff. I know all of them would like to be remembered in our prayers. Then just a few, a few that we'd like to add. Beth Lincoln this morning is not with us. She is dealing with an infection. I know she would like to be remembered in our prayers as she's uh, trying to get better. Also, Barbara Dees, this is John Dees' mother. She fell and broke her leg, and they are moving her into a nursing home. Uh, so I know that's a hard decision, and they would like to be remembered in our prayers as they go through that transition. Also, congratulations are in order for Josh and Claire Hooper, who were married yesterday in Columbia. Um, then a lot of different activities go on here at the building during the week, uh, one of which is our Dorcas ladies have been real, extremely busy. They make handmade bags for walkers to, and deliver them to the Poplar Estates Assisted Living. So we want to thank Judy Russell and the group of superstars that meet here every Tuesday. So if you would like to join them, you don't have to be an expert in sewing, uh, but you can join them on Tuesdays and they will help you find a place to fit in with that group. So thank you to the Dorcas ladies for all that they have done. Also, we want to invite everyone to come celebrate with the Richardson family and meet Levi and Maggie today um, from 3 p.m. until 4.30 in the fellowship hall. You can see where they're registered in the bulletin. And then on Friday night, May the 27th, we have, a, have an exciting opportunity that's being planned for personal evangelism training. Uh, this will be in the fellowship hall at 6.30. We'll, we'll, we will be having hot dogs and chili that will be followed by two 20-minute sessions uh, during which you will go through a Bible study guide with a partner and then rotate around to different partners doing the same, uh, doing the same or using a different Bible study guide. Uh, there will be five different guides to choose from with plenty of copies for everyone. Uh, the goal of this uh, project is, is for each of us to gain confidence and experience in, in engaging with others in sharing the gospel. Uh, there will be no public speaking um, involved in this, and it will conclude about 7.30. Uh, but this is open to everyone uh, who would like to join in. There will be more information in the bulletin about that. But that is Friday, May 27th at 6.30 p.m. If you have any questions... Uh, you can see myself or John Cottrell, um, and we will do the best to answer those for you. Uh, but those are the announcements that I have for this morning. If you would, bow with me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you for the day that you have blessed us with. Father, we lift all of those, uh, uh, those names up who have been mentioned in prayer uh, to you. We pray that you keep them in the hollow of your hand. Father, we also pray for all of the efforts in spreading your gospel. We pray that you be with each one of us as we enter in this period of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Number 595, number 595. Would you stand, please? Stand up.
of our opening prayer and scripture reading this morning, number 291. 291. <coughs> I know. Our continued scripture reading this morning will be Philippians 4, verses 1 through 9. <clears throat> Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Eudodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good rapport, and if there's any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day that we have to come here and worship thee this morning. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for our elders and deacons and us as church members and help us just to live for you and be what you'd have us to be and help us to be example to all those around about us. And 
Dear Lord, we're so thankful for our Savior Jesus Christ that came to this earth and died on the cross for our many sins. Dear Lord, continue to be with all our sick. <clears throat> be with Sharon Wilburn and Barbara Jones and Bobby Wilhart, Joanne Clark, uh, Jane Sweeney, and Sharon Woodruff and Beth Lincoln and John Dee's mother and watch over all them, dear Lord, and heal them and comfort them and may they not be in much pain and may they get better and dear Lord, just help us all to live for you each and every day and dear Lord, be with us this spring and summer and all of our events and be with our youth as they go to camp and be with Andy and Jennifer and Cody and Nikki and all the work that they do and Dear Lord, just help us to live for you, and may our youth and all live for you, dear Lord, and bless us and care for us, and be with us through this day, and be with us through this week. And dear Lord, we're thankful for Claire and Josh that were united in marriage last night, and be with them, and the beautiful wedding they had, and we pray that they will live for you. Be with us through the rest of this day and forgive us all our many sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As Ryan just read from the book of Philippians, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. As we're about to enter into the memorial of Jesus Christ, we're about to sing a song in preparation of that sacrifice. We'll sing number 268, and think about the words as you sing them, uh, and, and remember them, and what they mean. <clears throat> I
As we're preparing to take the Lord's Supper, to participate in this memorial to the death of Christ, I want to bring up something that in my life I've often forgotten about the Lord's Supper, and that we often think about Christ's death, his sacrifice, the blood, all of these things, his body that hung on the cross. That's a very important thing to do while we're taking of the Lord's Supper. But there's another step where we think that Christ has died for me, and when we're in wonder of that, there's another step where it's not just that Christ died for me, but he died for the person next to me. And he died for every person in this room, and he died for all of the people in, in all of the churches across the world, across this town, even though they're filled with people who, who look a little different, who act a little different, who talk a little differently of different ages, Yet we're still united into this one body. And this one body is participated in through this Lord's Supper, which we all take on Sunday morning or on Sunday, whatever time that may be. So before I pray, I just want to read for you 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, and then we'll pray. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Let's bow. Lord, we come before you now and we thank you so much for the choice that you made to come to this earth, to live the life that you lived, and to die for us, but not just for me personally, but for all of us. And because of that death, we are united, becoming Christians, becoming a part of your body. We pray that you guide our minds to reflect on that body this morning as we partake of the bread. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue this memorial meal, let's continue to remember Christ's sacrifice, what it means for us, and what it means for each of us together as we are the church and body of Christ. Let's bow. Lord, we thank you so much again for the sacrifice that you made on the cross, Lord. We're thankful for that and also the resurrection that was to follow, giving us hope of the resurrection to come. We pray that you guide our minds to think on what is righteous in this moment, what, what you would have us. In Jesus' name, amen.
in continuation with worship, but separate from the Lord's Supper, uh, we now have the opportunity to give back to Christ, his body, <clears throat> which is the, uh, <clears throat> which we can use to uh, keep the lights on for one, but also uh, spread Christ's love throughout the world. So let's bow as we bless the offering. Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you give to us. And we ask that when we are given gifts in general, we, we use them to give back to others. And that includes in our finances, Lord. We, we ask now that as we give back through our finances, we, we hope that we do so in a, in a cheerful manner, not out of obligation, but out of appreciation and joy. In Jesus' name, amen. For those that are using a song book, if you would go ahead, mark number 23 will be our song of invitation at the appropriate time. And before the lesson this morning, number 585, number 585, would you stand please? Soldiers of Christ.
If you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open them up to John chapter 14. I'll meet you. It's, I'll be there in, in just a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit before we get there. Um, as a matter of fact, this lesson is going to be a little bit different. Uh, typically, what I'll do is I'll put up a passage on the screen and we'll just kind of walk through it. Today, what we're doing is a little bit different. Now, we're just primarily focusing on the definition of a word, okay? Um, I believe that when it comes to Bible study, one of the most important things you can do for understanding the Bible is understanding the words that are used in the Bible. And what happens often is that we have Bible words that the Bible very clearly uses, and, and we use those words, but sometimes we don't have in our minds like a, a really good definition or understanding of what those words mean. And sometimes that can lead us into some understandings of things that are, are maybe a little off. Uh, sometimes it can lead us into some understanding of things that are way off, right? And so what happens is, is as we're studying the Bible, like we need to pay real close attention to the words that are being used and, and how those words are being used. Now, you've heard me explain this before with words like Christ, right? That I think often in the world, there are people who say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. If you ask them what that means, they have no idea. Uh, you know, what, what does it mean to say Jesus is the Christ? Uh, when we say Jesus is Lord, it's one of the most important things to believe. Now, like your salvation depends on you believing that he's Lord in Christ, but do you have an understanding of what that means? Beyond just those words, there's a number of other words that are, I don't know, we might call them like Bible words. Words we don't use a lot out in, in the regular world, but when we talk about the Bible, they're very important. Words like holiness and righteousness. Uh, words, I even love, though it's a word that's used a lot in the world, sometimes we don't have great understanding of what these words mean. And that leads us into some wrong understandings about things. Um, a word that recently I have been thinking about is like the word meat or solid food in the Bible. Uh, that a lot of times people will say they want the solid food of the word or the meat of the word. And what they really mean by that is, I want you to talk about the things I like to talk about, right? Or, or there are certain issues that I find particularly interesting. And those are the things that I want to address uh, on, on, on a regular basis. And yet words as they're used in the Bible have definitions and they have meanings and we need to come to know those words and what they mean as they are used in the Bible. Uh, the word truth is a word we're going to talk about today. What does it mean? To, to get this understanding, we're actually going to walk through the gospel of John for a little bit uh, because the gospel of John really hones in on the concept of truth. As a matter of fact, I think I mentioned Wednesday night in the devotional, if anyone was here, that the gospel accounts as you're reading them have a lot of similarities, right? But there's also differences, and we need to pay attention to those differences and pay attention to what is this particular author really trying to teach us when he's writing what he's writing. John, more than any other gospel author, talks about truth. It's in his gospel, it's in his epistles, like he really wants you to hone in and understand this concept of truth. And so what I'm going to do is I just want to walk through, and we're not going to talk about every place this word is used in John, it would take us too long to do that. I'm going to talk about some of the places that John talks about truth. Okay, so the gospel begins in John chapter 1 and verse 1 by saying, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. That's a really interesting way to describe Jesus. And, and that's what he's doing here, right? He's talking about Jesus. And yet he doesn't call him Jesus. He doesn't call him Christ or Lord. He defines him as the word. And that's one of the unique things about John is that John is very symbolic in the way he, he writes. Right? And, and so Jesus in the mind of, of John is like, he is what God wants to say to mankind. If you want to know what God thinks and what God is teaching, you look to Jesus, right? You look at the way he treats people. You look at the way he responds to situations. He is God's word. And, and so what do we learn about God's word? Well, verse 14 of chapter one, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth, that the word of God is full of truth. As a matter of fact, as you read throughout this, uh, this gospel, one of the things you'll notice is that Jesus has many people who are fighting against him. 
who argue with him and actually ultimately will become so mad at him and so angered by him and the things that he teaches and the things that he does that they will kill him. And to them, Jesus says this, John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Why are these people fighting so much with Jesus? Why is there such conflict between Jesus and and, and these Pharisees? It's because one is truth and one is of lies. One comes from God, the word of God, full of truth. The other, Jesus says, is born of the devil and full of lies. Truth and lies will always collide. And that's what you're seeing here. Truth and lies colliding. Because Jesus is not only full of truth, he'll actually say in John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So not only is he filled with it, he says, I am it. I am truth. And, and it's, it's really interesting because like, as, as we're getting to a point now in John 14 and verse 6, Jesus' ministry is kind of changing because he's now within what we often call the Passion Week, like the moments before his death, like the week leading up to his death. And one of the things he does in this time is he actually offers a prayer to, the, to God. Because Jesus knows I'm the word and I came full of truth. I am truth. And because I'm truth, the world full of lies and hatred, the children of Satan are fighting against me and they're going to kill me. What he also knows is as he's leaving, he's leaving his apostles in the world. And he wants them to be more like him. He wants them to be full of truth and to teach truth and to hold on to truth and to love truth. Yet he knows that the world will continue to persist in its lies. And so he says, John, in prayer to the Father, John 17 and verse 17, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. Interesting, right? In the beginning was the word the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory and he was full of truth. So the word of God came to this world full of truth. And now he's saying, sanctify them, these apostles, in your truth. Well, what is that? Your word is truth. Like, like it's just a constant and consistent theme throughout this book that you need to be grabbing onto that Jesus is truth and to cling to him, to be holy and sanctified to him. You have to be connected with and set apart from the world by truth. That's ultimately what sets us apart. That's ultimately what sanctifies us from the world. The world is full of lies and deception and falsehood. God is full of truth. What's going to sanctify us or set us apart from that world is that we're not going to hold to the lies and the deception and the falsehoods. We're going to cling to the truth. So as we get towards the end of the gospel, last time the word is used um, is in John chapter 18, verses 37 through 38, Jesus is on trial for his life. He's talking to Pilate. And to Pilate, he says, for this purpose, I was born. And for this purpose, I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. That's why I'm here, Jesus says. The beginning was the word and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he was full of truth. And he came so that you could know the truth also. So that I could know the truth. And to that, Pilate asks, what is truth? And in an interesting turn of events, the question is never answered. Jesus is taken away, he's beat, he's scourged, and he's killed. And that question just kind of like hangs out there. I really believe that when, when John 
inspired of God, obviously, is writing this letter. It's supposed to just hang out there for us. It's supposed to weigh on our minds, and we're supposed to ask ourselves that question. What is truth? I mean, Jesus says he's full of it. Jesus says he is it. Jesus says he came to bear witness to it. But what is truth? Okay, so if you're going to like study this word and and the way it's used, one of the things you'll find is that it is used three different ways in the Bible. Okay, the Greek word is aletheia. Uh, You don't need to remember that, but remember this. The word truth means these three things. It means factuality, honesty, and sincerity. If you were to look it up in a dictionary, those are the three types of ways you'll find that this word is used. Then when Jesus says, I am truth, what he's saying is I'm factual. See, sometimes people get facts wrong. Sometimes it's, it's, it's not intended, right? It's just the fact that we're humans, and we make mistakes. I'll tell you, I think I've already mentioned this, but another like clear example of this is last Sunday morning, I was up here preaching, right? And, and I was talking about Proverbs chapter 31 and it was a, it's a poem and I was kind of explaining, you know, the Hebrew and, and how it goes through. And I just like, as a side note, I mentioned the English language and, and I said that there's 27 letters in the English alphabet. And I was, it was brought to my attention uh, that... I was wrong, right? And, and I'm okay with that. As a matter of fact, I'm okay with it because I've gotten rather comfortable with it. Uh, I'm factually wrong often. Uh, you, you can often say, I listen to, if you listen to me for too long, you're going to realize every now and then I get some facts wrong, but I don't think I stand alone in that. People get facts wrong all the time. I promise you, I wasn't trying to lead you down a path, right? I wasn't like, I wasn't like, 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 like trying to steer you in a wrong direction. I was just wrong. And sometimes people are wrong. Sometimes people don't get facts right. Jesus says, I am the truth, which means I get the facts right. When I speak, you can obey it. You can listen to it. You can know that it's right, it's factual, it's accurate. But also, it's, it's honesty, Sometimes people aren't sincere in the way they talk. Sometimes it's not just a mistake that they make factually. Sometimes people try to mislead. Sometimes people will try to steer you in a direction you shouldn't go. Sometimes people will try to get themselves out of trouble. Sometimes people will try to get you into trouble. People will do all kinds of things for all kinds of reasons, but often what people do is they lie. Jesus in conversation with the Pharisee says, you're of your father, the devil. Why? Because he's a liar and that's what you're doing. You're lying about me. Actually, in order to have Jesus killed, they wanted a witness and they couldn't find one. So they just asked around for someone who would bear false witness. Like who's willing to lie about Jesus? Because people do that. And, And we have great confidence in our God because he's not that way. Jesus isn't that way. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19 and 20 describes hope as the anchor of our soul. And we say, why can hope anchor our soul so much? And if you read the preceding verses, you'll find out there's two reasons. You'll say there's two immutable things. One, God doesn't change. Secondly, God cannot lie. He doesn't lie. Doesn't, Doesn't ever come from his mouth lies. He's honest. He's true. And then he's sincere, right? And so what happens with people, again, is that we're often heavily influenced by those we're around. And so what happens is that there are times when, like, I'll act one way in front of this group and another way in front of another group, right? Where I want you to think I'm this way, but I want them to think I'm this way, And so around these people, I act the way I want them to think. And around these people, I act the way uh, I want them to think, right? And like, like we we, we fluctuate and we change because we're heavily influenced by people. Now, you know, around the church, I can be one way, you know, in kindness and love and always helpful. And then I get with my friends and I'm just gossip and slander and mean. 
Uh, or I can be this way with my parents and I can act a certain way and have certain language and certain behavior. Then I get around my group of friends and my language and behavior is completely different. Uh, or, you know, I can, I could go out in the world and act however I want. And then on Sunday m- morning, I spiffy myself up, put on my nice suit and tie and I come and I put on a pretty face, right? And the idea is that like people often change their behavior based upon the people they're around. I'm going to say this, and I want you to hear what I'm saying. I don't mean to say that God doesn't care about you, because he loves you and he cares about you. But know this, that, that God is not going to change who he is, because he's trying to impress you. He's not. He is who he is. When Moses said to Pharaoh, who should I say is coming? God says, I am. I am who I am. Right? And like, 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 we're not trying to impress anybody. I just am. I'm this way today. I'll be this way tomorrow. And, and, and throughout eternity, I am unchanging. I don't get around this group and act away and then get around this group and be like, I really want them to follow me. So I'm going to change who I am. God just is. And his behavior is what his behavior is. You can take it, you can leave it, but he ain't going to change it. He is sincere. He is honest. He is, he is factual. He is the truth. And so you take that and we look at one of these passages that Jesus was talking about. John 14 and verse six, uh, one through six. Jesus talking to his apostles. And by the way, they're troubled because he just mentioned the fact that he's about to die and he's about to leave. And he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Why would I believe him? It's because he's honest. It's because he's factual. It's because he's sincere. I believe him because he's not wrong about it. He's not misleading me. And he's not just telling it to me because that's what I want to hear. Believe me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Like I said it. I said I go to prepare a place for you. And if that's not true, do you think I would have said it? Because if it's not true, I wouldn't have said it. Why? Because I'm, 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 rely- like I'm, I'm honest, I'm factual, and I'm sincere. I wouldn't have told you that I go to prepare a place for you if it wasn't true because I'm not trying to just impress you by myself. I'm not lying to you. And I know all the facts. I'm telling you this is true, so you should believe it. You believe my father, believe in me. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Now, I'm telling you something. I am making you promises. I'm giving you hope about your future life. I'm leaving you here in this world full of people who hate you and will despise you, but I'm promising I will come again to you. Believe it. And you know the way to where I am going. And what's interesting about this is that you'll see Thomas speaks up and Thomas thinks Jesus is wrong. Thomas says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Thomas doesn't think he knows the way. Jesus says, you know where I'm going. And Thomas is like, "Uh uh-uh, no, I don't. I don't know where you're going. I don't know the way. And Jesus says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thomas, you've walked with me and talked with me. You've seen my deeds. You've seen my act. You've seen my my truth. You've seen what I've taught 
taught. You've heard me over and over and over and over again. You've listened to the lessons I've given. You've seen the way I've treated people. You've seen me. I'm telling you, maybe you don't appreciate it now, but that's it. I am the truth. You know it because you know me. You know the way to God because you know me. You know the truth that will lead you to God because you know me. You know how to have life with God because you know me. I, the way, the truth, the life. And no one gets to the Father except through me. Now on one hand, like that's thrilling if you know Jesus. On the other hand, it's rather exclusive. If you don't know Jesus, then you don't know the way. You don't have the truth. You don't have life. You can't possibly get to the Father without him. You could try to debate it, but what hangs out there is this question. What is truth? It is factuality and honesty and sincerity. It is Jesus. And Jesus just said, you cannot get to the Father except through him. He's not mistaken. He's not lying. And he's not just saying it so we'll be impressed. That is truth. That is right It's what Jesus came to bear witness to. If there's any in here this morning who have not obeyed the truth, who haven't believed the truth, haven't clung to it and and allowed that truth to be part of who they are, we would love to help you do that. If there's something we could do this morning to help you obey the truth, we want to help you in any way we can. If we can further study with you, we would love to further study with you. If we can pray for you, we would love to pray for you. If there's anybody in here this morning who needs to be baptized into Christ so that you can get to the Father, we would love to help you do that as well. If there's something we can do to help you in your walk with God, we give this opportunity to sit on one of the front rows while we stand and sing this invitation song.
Terry Alden has come forward and, and she'd like me to read this to you. And so I will do that. And then Clint will come up and, and lead us in a prayer. She says, I've been struggling with several things in my life and have tried to handle them on my own. As a result, my faith has uh, taken a back seat. Uh, I know now I need to stop relying on myself and hand my struggles over to God. I'm asking for the prayers of my Christian family to help me find my way back to putting God back on top in my life. Um, we want you to know how much we love you. Um, I tell you that two and a half years that, that we've been here, you've been an example to me and my family, and we love you, and, and, and we will continue to pray for you. Um, Would you bow your heads, please? Our God and our Father in heaven, the author of truth, our creator, our sustainer, our beloved, we thank you so much for blessing us with this day, a day that we could assemble here as brothers and sisters, as believers in your son, as worshipers of you. Father, we lift up Carrie and Dale, but especially Carrie this morning to you. We pray that you relieve her of her anxiety and of her need to only take care of things by herself and to rather rely on you your broad shoulders, your infinitely broad shoulders, your love, the hope that comes through Christ. We pray that as her brothers and sisters, that we can rally around her and continue to lift her up in prayer and to help her and minister to her in any way that we possibly can. She has touched so many lives in this in this assembly. We love her and esteem her for her example. We love her and esteem her for her ever-present smile. In many ways, she, who's, she is whom we would like to emulate and we lift her up to you this morning. Father, we love you, we are in awe of you. Please help us to be the love and the truth that you are. We approach you through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. We would invite you back at our services tonight, begin at 5 p.m. We'll sing our closing song this morning, number 523. If you stand, please, we'll sing the first, second, and four stanzas. <clears throat>
Would you please bow with me? Our Father in heaven, thank you for continuing to bless us and leading us in this life. Father, at this time, we pray for the health impaired individuals of the congregation, whether it be cancer, heart, severe pain. We pray for those names that are known to us and also for those individuals that are suffering in private. Please guide them and be with their families. Father, we ask for your guidance for our brothers and sisters in the war-torn countries of Ukraine and Russia. Please comfort them and guide them during this troublesome time. Guide them so that they continue to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, for many here in the United States, graduation time is upon us and it's a happy time for all. We ask that you guide the young people in their decision-making of life at this time that you will always be a part of their future. Father, bless this congregation. Be with the teachers as they teach us and guide us in your word. Father, we thank you for guarding our life, for this is our prayer in Christ's name, amen.